So, in the ancestral lineage, um, Keith Thomas was uh, your teacher, and Keith's teacher was Christopher Hill. That's right. Um, did you come across Christopher much? Quite a bit. I mean, I, I asked him to talk to the College History Society. This is the typical way in which you get to know a leading historian in another college. Mm. And he was absolutely charming and uh, continued to see quite a bit of him on and off. He was invited to Sussex when I was at Sussex in the early days. I um, when he became Master of Balliol and I uh, wrote a letter to congratulate him, he had a marvellous um, postcard that he sent me, he said he hoped that Brighton in the Broad would live up to the tradition of Balliol by the Sea. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't think I continued to get so much from him intellectually. I mean, I think as a Marxist, he was never as interesting as Eric Hobsbawm or Edward Thompson, because they were more creative with the concepts. He was a man deeply learned in 17th century England, who was also a Marxist, but he didn't um, if like develop his Marxism at all. It was it, it just um, stuck, and so it came to seem less interesting. So my admiration for him is above all as a person. I think he was a wonderful choice as Master of Balliol. Both um, Christopher and Keith were in the tradition of uh, what Trevor Roper described as thin trickles of text through lush meadows of foot footnotes. Mm. Um, not so much, but. Basically, they were great um, quotas yeah. of um, thousands of uh, pamphlets and yes. so on and so on. Did, did either of uh, those people influence you in the way you actually uh, wrote and, and studied history by using quotations or not? I don't think so. That is, I think there are so many historians before them who've used quotations effectively. Yeah. And I never had a moment of sudden discovery that a few quotations together would tell a story very well and you'd hardly need to intervene. Mm. And it, it's, it's still a, um, a great challenge and a great pleasure to match the right quotations. I mean, I like quotations which bounce off one another and each of them modifies your perception of the other one. And so the, the placing and so on. And I certainly have never gone in for footnotes on a Thomasian hmm. scale. Maybe that was um, the fault of my apprenticeship to Trevor Opa, who took these things much more lightly and used to make jokes about ponderous people and long footnotes, and despite his admiration for Gibbon. Hmm. But, so there I'm not so sure. This is possibly a, a point to ask you about your writing methods. Yeah. I mean, do you... Um, I've, I've seen samples of your yeah. writing, so I, I roughly know, but do you write uh, with a typewriter, a computer? Uh, what's your traditional method and how much do you change things uh, mm. and redraft? Ever, ever since 1985, I've written on the computer. I mean, as soon as I got one, mm. I found that it was easier to write on the disc than it was to write on paper. Mm. And now I constantly revise. Mm. I mean. W I like to pick up a subject, work on it, drop it for a week or two, do something else, come back to it. I like to drop a subject for years and come back to it. Um, I'm working on a couple of articles now. One of them was a paper at Oxford in 1970. I never felt I'd got it quite right. On various occasions, I've taken it up again. Now, in memory of Roy Porter, I think I can actually send the thing off. So... Um, they're definitely returning to things, elaborating things, occasionally dropping things, but usually just on another layer of encrustation. Mm. And before the computer, I was literally a scissors and paste person. Mm. So I, um, I typed, a, I mean, I didn't write, I typed it. Mm. And then I didn't like it, but, but I thought some of it I could use again, so I cut it up and really I did have a big glue pot. Mm. But the problem with scissors and paste, you may remember, is you get it on the desk, and then <laughs> so you have the bits of paper sticking to the desk, sticking to one another. And so the move to metaphorical cut and paste has been a real liberation for me. And do you like writing? Do you uh, yes, uh, um, especially any draft after the first. Mm. And I also 
and this goes back to school, um, sentences come in my head when I'm walking. Mm. And I always have to have a little notepad. It's very peculiar. Completely formed sentences emerge in the way that poems do for poets. Of course, I've got to write all the other sentences. Mm. But, um, and the, so the great thing is, read a book or be writing notes, do something intensely, then stop, go for a walk, and then the unconscious just does it and throws up the thing that I don't know how long it would have taken me to find it, but I, I'm just given it. It's just great luck. So do you regularly go for walks while you're working or break off? Or? I, um, my, the best system of all that I've found is, yes, this is another curious thing. I think um, writing is a good start for research rather than the end product. Only when I start to write about something do I discover what I really need to know. So I say, write in the morning. That's thrown up a whole list of queries. Cambridge is wonderful for this. I walk to the university library. On the on walking to the university library, I stop two or three times because a sentence has come. In the library, I try to solve all the questions that came up in the morning. Next morning, insert these passages, rewrite go on a bit, new questions, go back to the library the next afternoon. I, um, for me, it's an absolutely ideal system with the most intense activity being the writing and I'm freshest in the morning. Mm. And then I've got a bit more patience in the afternoon and don't um, to go through the books and let people tell me things in their own time as authors will. Mm. And I don't work very much in the evening. Mm. It is funny, different people have very different rhythms. So um, let's, the other person uh, or school which you're very much associated mm. with is the Annal School right. in France. And uh, how did you come in touch with them and particularly with the work of Rodel? Definitely while I was an undergraduate, I'd found Rodel's Mediterranean and read it and was already enthusiastic about it before I uh, took schools. And I think Brodel was the first person uh, where, where Keith used this famous technique and I remember him, him saying, I think Brodel's rather overrated, don't you? And, I, and to this day I cannot work out whether that was because he thought that or whether he was um, trying me out or, or what. But, um, but anyway, that fixes in my mind exactly when I was reading it. And then I went to other people from his footnotes and I went back to Febre, to whom the book was dedicated, and found that despite the um, over flamboyant style for me, for most English people, he was saying really exciting things. And then, of course, Mark Bloch. And I therefore did think as a graduate student that it might be interesting to go and work with Brodel. Well, I never did. Um, the Jesuits would have been okay because there's a piece in the Mediterranean where he talks about their role in the Philip II's takeover of Portugal. And I'd come across a book written in by a Portuguese Jesuit which managed to demonstrate the contrary. And I, I'd always thought of sending Brodel a note. Did he know that a particular statement in a particular paragraph of the great book had been undermined by this piece of research? Um, which I think would have intrigued him coming from a graduate student and I would have at least been invited to go and call on him if I was in Paris. But maybe it was a good thing not to. I mean, he's a powerful intellectual presence at a distance. When I did meet him, I once interviewed him for the BBC and afterwards I met him a few times. He's such a powerful personality that the danger would be of being taken over, becoming a Brodelian in a groupy sort of way. That just as I didn't want to be a Marxist, but I wanted to learn from Marx. Mm. I, w I wanted to learn from Brodel, but not be any kind of uh, Brodelian or whatever. Mm. Trevor Roper was helpful there because of all British historians in 1960, he was probably the most openly sympathetic to an owl mm. um, without um, ever um, belonging to the school or anything like that. Mm. So... 
for many years now, I've always tried to approach things at least by asking the big Brodellian questions, the things about connections. So total history, not in the sense that you've got absolutely every detail, but total history in the sense that you look at every domain of human behavior and you always ask if one of them has made an impact on all the others mm. and the long durée. So even if you're, in, if you're studying 10 or 50 years, always place it in the larger context. However big your topic, it could always be put in a still more global context. That's what I've learned from him. Mm. I've had fun teaching uh, in the Cambridge Supervision System and for one week you give people an essay on the Ottoman Empire and they write about the times when the Turks invaded Central Europe. But of course there are other times that the Turks didn't. And then you ask them, uh, have they any explanation of why there were moments when a particular Sultan is trying to capture Vienna or Belgrade and other times not? Is it just aggressive and unaggressive sultans, or wouldn't it be a good idea to look at the Ottoman Empire's eastern frontier? And of course, we don't know so much about the history of Persia, but enough to know that sometimes the Turks were on the defensive. And then, then this, um, sometimes as a parting shot, I say, well, maybe one ought to know what's happening on the eastern frontier of the Persian Empire as well. These things um, can never be stopped. And would never have said that if it hadn't been for reading Brodel. Excellent. Well, let's, let's move on from Oxford now to Sussex. Hmm. Um, what, when did you go to Sussex and what was it like? I'm when? very proud to be able to say that I went in 62. That is, I arrived while they were laying the dining hall floor. Hmm. So, and we were in these prefabricated huts on the edge of the campus because the building wasn't on time. So there was the real sense that we were starting something, which was terribly exciting. Um, and all the more, and the sense, there is no tradition at this place. We are going to have to make a tradition now. That's also good for a historian. The second meeting of the School of European Studies, somebody already quoted the first meeting as a precedent. <laughs> and I should have written it in, my, uh, in a diary. Yeah. But I remember thinking, you know, this is how historical traditions get created. And it was a great liberation. I mean, I applied for the job because I'd heard Asa Briggs talk about history and sociology at this series of Oxford lectures. And he'd happened to remark casually that all this kind of interdisciplinary thing, this is just what was going to be institutionalized at the university that was going to start in the following October. And so I actually wrote to him and said, are there going to be any jobs? And he sent me a postcard saying advertisements will be in three months' time. Mm. So I duly applied and got it, and there was this challenge to invent new courses because all the people senior to me were trying to invent new courses, so they had no time to tell the assistant lecturers what to do. There were so many of us aged 25, mm. um, ex straight from being graduate students and research fellows and all allowed to do our own thing. And then the chances for collaboration on one side with sociology and on the other side with literature, also with philosophy if I wanted, were enormous and I benefited um, to a very great degree. I would have been very happy to collaborate a bit with anthropology but um, I um, the first professor was Freddie Bailey. Um, he caught me one day with Malinowski under my arm. I just got it out of the university library. And so he grinned and said, you know, we anthropologists don't believe in that stuff anymore. <laughs> uh, which, which was a little bit of telling somebody no trespassing, I think, though he did it in a very nice way. Mm. And that, uh, that you people will, won't understand that we've got our own um, development and so on. Um, where sociology, which I think that is the tradition, sociology is more like a city maybe, and anthropology more like a village or a tribe. Mm. Um, sociologists thought I could just as well teach sociology anybody as anybody else if I wanted. Mm. And 
Of course, Acer in particular being a historian thought that I could. Mm. And right from the first year I was teaching a course in sociological theory. That's how I learned it actually, mm. week by week, reading the textbooks. Mm. And um, helped by the fact that Norman Birnbaum, in whose seminar I'd given this Oxford mm. paper, he'd volunteered to write me an extra reference for the Sussex job, mm. just to tell Asa that I'd given a paper about sociology. It might have been the reason. It must have been quite competitive, that job. I don't know who else was in for it. Mm. Maybe being given a fourth unsolicited reference was just the thing that made the difference. Mm. Anyway, um, the, the sense then that it was all permissible to invade other people's disciplines, that there were people that would welcome you into learning about theirs, mm. that they would teach a joint seminar with you. Mm. That, it was wonderful to have that, in, that support mm. when I was branching out in these ways. Uh, I'm equally grateful for the fact that Cambridge was the opposite when I arrived in 79, mm. and it was like standing in the cold shower. I mean, you had to justify every borrowing from another discipline in the history faculty. Mm. Um, because by that time I'd got the confidence mm. that maybe I was getting a little uncritical of it. And so to be forced to justify to these people why I'd spent all this time reading books on, um, written by people in other disciplines, mm. that, that was quite good as well. Were there any people in Cambridge, uh, obviously Geoffrey Elton springs to mind, mm. were there others who uh, were forcing you to be uh, explained? Explain oh yes. Um, especially when I and Bob Scribner, who was a very close colleague for a few years while he was in Cambridge, we set up this course called Historical Anthropology. Mm. And of course it had to go to the faculty board. Mm. And the faculty board kept sending it back. They would find some very trivial reason for sending it back, but it was happening too often. So of course we smelt a rat and we, we, because Derek Beals was opposed on principle to it. So one year when he wasn't in the chair, the chairman simply asked me to come to the meeting to explain what I wanted to do with this new paper. And then Derek didn't say anything. Um, it would be too embarrassing to have a confrontation mm -hmm. like that. And then the faculty board sent me such a funny note that it was fine to do this course, I quote, as long as there was no theory in it. <laughs> so of course we said yes, and of course we took no notice. And it was a course that the students really loved and it ran for six years and I'm very happy that it, it went. So by the 80s, by that point in the 80s, although there was the opposition in the faculty, there were also other people who said, well, why don't you let them have a go? These are two trained historians, they're not going to be unhistorical. Mm. Maybe the students will find it fun. And that, those colleagues won. Mm. Well, the other cold shower which um, afflicted you when you came to Cambridge was Emmanuel College. Um, yes. Can you say something about that? That's right. And, and, and to be f fair, um, it wasn't a colder shower than most colleges <laughs> would have been because it, it was and remains a very friendly place, but it was still a culture shock coming from Sussex where everything was informal and we had a kind of rather informal lifestyle. So, so much so, I'm not sure that I owned a tie in 1979. I, um, I know I'd got married in one, but I'm not sure whether I'd kept it because um, I either wore open neck in the summer or polo neck in the winter. So I arrive in Emmanuel and I start dining and I notice out of the corner of my eye that other people are wearing ties, but I don't object to other people wearing ties, so I thought no more about it. And to the credit of the college, nobody complains the whole term. And then there's this annual meeting of the parlour, which is a slightly larger group than the SCR. And they passed a resolution reaffirming the good old custom that gentlemen dining in the evening, brackets, clergy accepted, should wear ties. <laughs> but we were all sent a copy of this. They didn't send anything specially to me. So I thought that was such a very gentle reminder that I was prepared to conform. Whereas if I'd been told you have to wear a tie, I might have reacted like Wittgenstein and given up dining because he had this problem I remember with Trinity in the 1930s. Mm. 
but there were so many little customs mm. that um, sometimes exasperating, but sometimes just fascinating. I started to take notes. Mm. And it was a way of coping with the cultural shock to pretend that I was the anthropologist and write everything in, in my notebook. And some younger colleagues knew I was doing it. And if somebody in the governing body said something very stupid, somebody might whisper in my ear, put it in your notebook. <laughs> And I didn't really think more of this until in 82 there was a conference on art history in Italy and there was Bourdieu working on art at that time but also on higher education. And as soon as he heard I was from Cambridge, he had all these questions. He wanted to know, how does the university work? And in the course of all this, then I somehow found myself telling him, well, I'd got field notes on a college. And so he roared with laughter and he said, choose any name you like, I'll publish this in the Acte de la Recherche Sociale. So I took him very literally and in about a week I just wrote an article and signed it William Dell and called it St Dominic's Notes Towards the Ethnography of a Cambridge College. And this, this was so that the real insiders would know um, what it was about because Emmanuel, as you know, is on the site of the Dominican Friars in Cambridge. And William Dell was once a fellow of Emmanuel, who was asked to give the university sermon. Um, he was a hero of Christopher Hills, actually, who's, who wrote an article about him, because he gave the university sermon in front of the Vice-Chancellor in full um, regalia against gowns, hoods, tippets, and such such like anti-Christian forms and follies, also against the use of Latin in the university. Because he was a real radical Puritan of the kind that Oliver Cromwell and Christopher Hill loved. Actually, Cromwell took him out of a manual and made him master of keys. And he was ejected in 1660 and went to a country living in Bedfordshire. And the first thing he did was ask John Bunyan, who of course was not in the Church of England, to... Um, preach from his pulpit. So right down to the end of his life, Dell liked um, doing unconventional things. So I thought that was a nice nom de plume. So there it is. It's, been, it's had a great life as a sum is that, mm. at least among graduate students. Mm. But um, Cambridge, like England in a sense, being um, so much a culture of the implicit, mm. um, I cannot tell whether some of my conservative colleagues know about this or not. <laughs> I suppose I shall never know. You'll never know. Um, returning to another person who I know has influenced you a lot, um, how was it that you came across Raphael Samuel mm. and um, what influence uh, has he had on your work? Yes. Raphael met in Oxford in 64 when I'd gone back for a, a term, with, had a term's leave and was thinking of getting back to my PhD. And at that point, um, he was very interested in the history of religion and popular religion. And he was starting a series of graduate seminars. And there was Jill Thomas, not yet Jill Sutherland. And there was Gareth Stedman Jones. And there was a very quiet young man who, as I remember, didn't say anything in the seminars, but he still came every week, Roderick Flood. And there might have been another couple of people I've forgotten. And so we had a very informal series of seminars in which I talked about Jansenism. And, oh yes, and John Walsh came and talked about Methodism and Raph about the 19th century and so on. And he's one of the most charismatic people I've ever met. And after Edward Thompson, the one that did most, I think, to give working class history in Britain a kind of epic, quality. Um, it, when, when he talks about it, it just sounds like the most important subject in the world. Um, and then we kept up, up ever since. I mean, um, because in Sussex you couldn't do research, so I used to go twice a week to the British Museum, which was where the library still was, and kept bumping into Raph in the round reading room and we would go out to lunch and talk and so on. That lasted years and years. Um, he was a kind of elder brother figure because he was always encouraging me to do things. He wanted me to be more committed to the left and um, uh, 
He was always greeting me with fist clenched, though I'm afraid I never really got round to doing this in return. And then he used to organise these incredible Ruskin conferences, which by the early 70s, I remember somebody in The Guardian said, had the atmosphere of a small pop festival. And there was this one on childhood in history and children's liberation. And because I was interested in the ideas of Philip Arias, who was after all part of the Annal, mm. and Raf knew this, he asked me to give the, this talk about does childhood have a history and was it invented in France in the 17th century? What can it mean to say this? And I remember a couple of small children crawling onto the platform and of course in such an atmosphere nobody was ever going to pick them up. So um, I went on lecturing while um, surrounded by small children. <laughs> and then there was another one about socialist history, um, which was very interesting. And, uh, and at some point, I remember um, saying, uh, we, we had to kind of give our confession of faith. So I said I was a socialist and a historian, but I wasn't a socialist historian, because I didn't think history could be written from just one point of view. And an elderly trade unionist got up and said, you mean we ought to write history from the boss's point of view? <laughs> um, so, um, and those, those seminars um, at Oxford, and then the big workshops, but above all, in this case, it was Raphael's personality, this one, um, and seeing history from below. And maybe I wouldn't have written that book on popular culture in the 70s, if I hadn't become a great friend of Raff's in the 60s. Mm. The other person who was um, very dynamic certainly, uh, and a great uh, writer in the same league as yourself was Roy Porter. Mm. Did you know Roy? Whom I didn't meet till the late 70s when mm. I was asked by actually Emmanuel History mm. Society when not knowing I was ever going to have a connection with that college. Mm. So. Um, they wanted me to give a talk on some very general subject, and I said, history of mentalities. Is, um, should there be a history of mentalities? And so I give the talk, and then there is this um, young, youngish man with his shirt right open, um, um, and his hair all over the place, and he asks the first question about um, what do I think about the relation to mentalities and ideology, and... Um, this turns into a kind of conversation rather than just me answering the question. And he seems very sympathetic, and I get to talk to him, and that was Roy. Mm. And very few years later, we started to collaborate. And um, I forget how many books we both contributed to. Even the ones we edited together add up to three or four, let alone the ones we both contributed to. So I, I do think of him, uh, in, he was about nearly 10 years younger than me. Mm but very much pursuing within British history the kind of career I was trying to pursue for European. Which perhaps takes us to two last questions mm. I'd like to ask you. One is, if you had to summarise what you think the question behind your work, the, the major questions behind your work have been, um, what are you really seeking for? Yeah. Um, it's a very difficult yeah. Summarize it, but in two or three minutes, could you outline that? There are two very big problems I have been wrestling with all my life, and one is about how far there is a European history. That is, it's really how much there's a common culture for all those countries. And uh, I mean, I never wanted to think of Europe as just Western Europe. And I suppose. Um, it's really for one psychoanalyst to answer this rather than oneself. But I've got to think of it as trying to bring my two pairs of grandparents together, since they come from the western and eastern edges of Europe. And so in some sense I do. And therefore to be a whole person I have to try to look at Europe as a whole. But then the other question that emerged relatively early for me was the history and theory one. What has, um, surely if sociologists, anthropologists, and later I started to think geographers and political scientists have, have got insights into human behavior, they must be relevant to history. Um, 
if they're true, we've got to use them. Um, and maybe the best way of testing them is going to be to try to use them in history, because almost all the social science concepts are coined in a context which is that of the present, somewhere or other. So if you take them back a couple of centuries, you're always asking, is this a key that only fits one particular lock, or is it some kind of master key that might open more locks? So I, so I do think that historians have got quite a useful function, even though we steal so many concepts from our colleagues in the social sciences, we give them so very few concepts in return. The one thing that we can do is always this um, testing in a new set of circumstances, which is quite a, a harsh but quite a valuable test for any concept to go through. So I suppose those are the two big things which I've been trying to do through doing smaller things all my working life. Lovely. And the last question is really, um, recently you've married a Brazilian. Um, if you sit, sit back. Mm -hmm. um, I just wondered whether you wanted to say anything about Maria and about Brazil, um, which you're going off to after you retire. It's hard to make it a short question. Um, I suppose, again, trying to stand outside and look, look at myself from outside. Mm. I've always been drawn to Latin cultures. I was very excited to start working on Italy by doing an Italian Renaissance special subject when I was an undergraduate. I mean, I took to the country instantly mm. and then to Spain. And then when somebody arrived in my college to invite me to lecture in Brazil, um, I both found that individual captivating and was deeply attracted by the idea of getting to know Brazil. And that was Maria Lucia, whom I happened to meet on Emmanuel soil because she came with this message, would I give a course of lectures in Sao Paulo? And so um, discovering her and discovering Sao Paulo and discovering Brazil have all got mixed up together. It's an unending um, thing, this discovery. And I remember trying to see Brazil as a kind of Italy. I mean, an enormous and even more chaotic sort of Italy and seeing that in some ways this didn't work. And then, of course, discovering that Maria Lucia's family is about as culturally mixed as mine because she's Spanish on one side, Italian on the other, yet speaks Portuguese, which is very typical Brazilian sort of thing. So between us, um, we are quite a mixture. I mean... So her parents were migrants, my grandparents were migrants. And in Brazil, they take it for granted that everybody's a migrant. And the first question they ask you where you're from, then if you say Britain, and they say, and where's your family from? <laughs> the, the absolute assumption that it's going to be somewhere else. It's, mm. I find this very refreshing. Mm. And, it, uh, and thanks to Singapore and thanks to Italy, I was already adjusted to the idea that the apparent rules may not be the real rules, or as Brazilians love to put it, the distance between the legal country, the uh, país legal, and the real place, the país real, it can be um, quite a big distance. <laughs> well, I think on that nice Brazilian <laughs> note, um, we sadly ought to end, but I want to thank you very much indeed, Peter, yeah. interviewing you. I almost felt I was at times interviewing myself. Many <laughs> of the right. Our yeah. experiences and interests and ways of looking at things are so very similar. It was a particular pleasure. So thank you very much indeed. Well, thank you for giving me the chance. <laughs>